Hello everyone, my name is Bradley and I love traveling, right? And you know, if there's one rule that I've learned over the years about surviving in a foreign country, it's that you should always have cash on you. Now, I'm talking about this because once in the Netherlands, I actually tried to buy a painting I liked in a small gallery. Not only could I not buy it, but I also found myself eventually in a foreign country without any money whatsoever. Why? Well, my card was actually blocked by the bank on suspicion of money laundering. Now, of course, I've already spoken to you many times about how real criminals do this in the real world. But today, I'm going to take a closer look at how banks fight against these scammers. Who do you think blocked my card? Was it human or artificial intelligence? Maybe I was the first victim of a real machine uprising. Now, criminals launder probably about a trillion dollars every single year. And if they did it the old fashioned way through laundries or washes, right, they would need one in six of all printed dollars. To transport all this wealth to a secret vault, you'd have to load 2,500 trucks with $100 bills. That's why these days money laundering occurs not through cash transactions. In the United States alone, financial organizations actually spent more than $7 billion annually to combat this. And it's the same amount of money as investors have invested in SpaceX over the years, from the moment of its conception through to the launch of the first crew to the ISS. Not even gravity contains humanity when we explore as one for all. Of course, this makes more sense if we're talking about rockets, right? But what is this much money actually spent on in the financial system? Just a couple of years ago, the main tool for combating money laundering was manual verification of all banking transactions. Every day, analysts of American banks had to check up to 800,000 transactions. It's not surprising that many programs have appeared on the market that help to identify such suspicious transactions. But now, you know, the industry is undergoing some serious revolutionary changes. According to the Association of Certified Anti-Money Laundering Specialists, more than half of all banks worldwide are already engaged in the implementation of artificial intelligence in their AML processes. Now let's figure out what artificial intelligence is really capable of and whether or not it can actually defeat the human intelligence of scammers. So the very concept of anti-money laundering, or AML for short, entered banking practice in 1989. Now the Group for the Development of Financial Measures to Combat Money Laundering, FATF, the Financial Action Task Force, proposed the first international AML standards, so the ways to implement them and also methods to combat the financing of terrorism. Let's imagine that I am working as an AML analyst in a bank that, say, doesn't use an artificial intelligence system. Well, what do I have to do? Of course, I don't have to manually review each transfer. The initial selection is done by a computer algorithm that basically looks for signs of suspicious behavior in transactions. Now, the algorithm also pays attention to attempts to interact with countries or spheres of business that are recognized as high risk. For more advanced systems, a history of transactions is actually kept for each payer. And transactions also that are not typical of previous activities are submitted to manual review. This all sounds quite impressive, but in fact, it's a set of very simple rules. Transferring money to Russia or Iran is a suspicious operation, a red flag. The transfer of a million dollars by a firm that usually operates in tens of thousands is a red flag, as is, say, the purchase of chemical fertilizers by an IT company. Now, a set of thousands of such rules is a fairly reliable filter, but the final decision always lies with the person. But let's return to our automated systems. Do you know what their work actually reminds me of? Chess computers. Now, chess is obviously a very difficult but extremely logical game. The pieces, their initial locations and possible moves, well, these are all strictly regulated by the rules of the game and they don't change throughout. The number of combinations is huge here and it also grows with every move. Ooh, that is dirty. That is awesome. Really awesome. My team and I have launched a second channel, SumSub for Experts. And if on this channel for the past year, I've told you about how to protect yourself and your data in the wild online jungle, 
Then the second channel is for those who are already professionals in their field. For those who are interested in biometric user identification technologies, as well as those who would like to learn more about KYC, KYB, AML, and also countering online fraud. We hope that this channel will form a great community of professionals with whom we can share our experience and use cases, discuss new fintech technologies and changes in legislation. This channel is hosted by my colleague, Tony. He's the chief legal officer at SumSub and also my good friend. In our next video, Tony will interview experts from Cyprus. Now, he will explain why Cyprus is becoming such a popular location for crypto businesses and also what makes it different from Estonia, Lithuania and other very popular jurisdictions. In the near future, we will talk about open banking, about corporate registries, as well as self-sovereign identity solutions. In 1950, the American mathematician Claude Shannon calculated that in chess, there's a possibility of 10 to the power of 120 unique games. Now, it's impossible to calculate such a figure with outright enumeration. But then, how did a computer beat a human at chess? Now, the computer algorithm does not iterate through all possible combinations here. On each one, it filters out the extra moves. In fact, such algorithms actually cut off about 95% of obviously losing lines and analyze the remaining ones. Now, based on this algorithm, I suppose, uh, IBM actually built the Deep Blue Chess Supercomputer in 1997. It looked like two cabinets into which they managed to actually cram 480 chess processors and 30 gigabytes of RAM. And all of this allowed the computer to calculate up to 330 million positions per second. At a match in New York, Deep Blue actually managed to beat the strongest chess player in the world, Garry Kasparov. But contrary to numerous articles, this was not a victory for artificial intelligence. The only thing it could do, although with incredible speed, was sort through the data according to clearly defined rules. Furthermore, it didn't know how to learn. The algorithm of the game did not change depending on the opponent's play or in reaction to the moves that they make. See, by definition, intelligence, natural or artificial, is the ability to perceive information and retain it to adapt one's behavior. Therefore, the IBM chess atherometer is very similar to the programs that many banks used just a few years ago. AML analysis is much more complicated than chess. Despite all of the bureaucracy, instructions, laws, and regulations, money laundering is a game without rules. Criminals use non-standard moves that go beyond the framework of laws and patterns. And also, finding loopholes through which they can channel money as quickly as possible. They're certainly not playing by the rules here. After all, sometimes even financial regulators of entire countries prefer to turn a blind eye to such illegal activities. It's just easier. Have you ever heard of Moldova? It's a small agrarian country, formerly part of the USSR, but gained its independence in 1991. In the 20 years since, it has been chosen as the metaphorical laundromat for all money laundering activities by Russian oligarchs. You can appreciate how beautiful the scheme that they came up with is. Two offshore companies concluded a fictitious loan, well, for hundreds of millions of dollars, but of course, in reality, no money was actually transferred to the borrower. The guarantors of the debt were Russian companies and citizens of Moldova. Now, the borrower did not pay his debt and the lender made demands on the guarantors. The case was examined by the Moldovan court and for this purpose, local guarantors were needed. A corrupt judge issued an official order obliging the Russian company to pay the debt. The company was happy to pay for this non-existent transaction, withdrawing hundreds of millions of dollars to offshore companies. Well, during the existence of such a scheme, criminals actually laundered $21 billion through Moldova and also Latvia. Now, for comparison, the Moldovan budget last year was 10 times less than this figure at only 2.4 billion. Did such sums really not attract the the attention of the country's central bank? Well, in order not to attract the attention of AML specialists, according to the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project, money was transferred in small accounts to 732 banks from 96 countries around the world. Automated systems didn't see any violations of the rules here. The companies complied with legal court decisions, right? And hence, there was no reason for the red flags to appear. Human experts also ignored formerly legitimate transactions, right? 
The activities of the Moldovan laundromats were revealed only thanks to the hard work of journalists from a dozen different countries. Moreover, the reason for the investigation was data leaks from anonymous sources. AML systems of the previous generation are not designed really to work with real-time payments. For each operation, they must perform a series of sequential checks. When analyzing a payment, a few basic conditions are checked first. For example, they search the payer and recipient in certain blacklists. It is only the next level that the activity of the client and the change in the nature of the regularity of payments can be analyzed. Now, there's a risk here of missing several suspicious payments before the client actually attracts any attention. Now, the use of standardized rules significantly increases the risk of false positives. And that's exactly what happened to my card. The purchase of the painting was regarded by the program as a potential withdrawal of money. Now, the expert agreed with the program because he didn't see any other payments from my card in this region whatsoever. The last operation was actually performed just 12 hours prior in the vicinity of London. The AML expert then deduced that my data was stolen by scammers and blocked it as a result. According to experts, it's only about five in a hundred suspicious transactions that are actually illegal. You need to remember also the burden on AML employees is growing in proportion to the growth in the volume of operations. Stress increases as any suspended transaction threatens to actually lose or damage that client relationship. So you really have to work in a short time frame here. And this even more so increases the likelihood of human error. In addition, a person is not able to keep in mind all of the operations taking place at the bank. At best, they can only focus on their sector. Now, if I really worked as an AML analyst, my job would remind me of panning for gold. It's often necessary to sift through hundreds of kilograms of ore to find perhaps only a few grains of gold. But is it really possible to identify these kinds of schemes without informants and before a couple of years have passed? I'm talking in real time and using only the data that you've got your hands on and say customer knowledge? Well, the answer is yes. And for this, you'll have to change the traditional chessboard for a Goban. Now, this is the name of a playing field for Go, right? For many years, this ancient Chinese game remained to be the holy grail for artificial intelligence developers. Go has far fewer rules than chess, or checkers for that matter. Two players effectively take turns laying out their stones to create a territory that is larger than that of their opponents. And that's basically all the rules that it has. But computers learned to actually beat a person in this game of Go only in 2015, 18 years later than in chess. But why do you think that is? Well, it's all about the number of options here. There are 361 possible initial moves in Go and 360 possible responses. Now that's 129,960 combinations after the first round alone. Even cutting off weak moves, it's impossible to solve such a task through brute force measures. To win this game, developers had to change their approach. AlphaGo, as Google's DeepMind programmers called it, is based on neural networks. Now, the way it works is somewhat resemblant to that of our brain. The creators didn't need to upload complex algorithms for playing Go to AlphaGo, just the basic rules, the size of the field, the order of moves, and also the scoring mechanism. And then they began to train the network step by step by introducing parties of real players. The network identified patterns, successful and failed chains of moves, and also a general strategy of behavior. This is called the learning process with a teacher. And it's by this principle that most neural networks are trained. However, the disadvantage here is obvious. Without a large training sample of data, nothing will work at all. After we take that first version that's learned to mimic human play, we then allow it to play itself 30 million times on our servers. And uh, using reinforcement learning, um, it, the, the, the system learns to improve itself incrementally uh, through uh, it avoiding its errors. But unlike Deep Blue, AlphaGo didn't need any special equipment, so training could take place in one of Google's cloud services. It took the program four weeks to analyze this data. After that, the network was able to predict 57% of the moves of real people. But this wasn't really enough to ensure a guaranteed victory, right? And therefore, programmers began to force the network to play with itself. Each game improved the algorithm of the network, and soon the effectiveness of the game increased by a further 80%. Until in 2015, AlphaGo won its first resounding victory by beating three-time European champion Fan Hui with a score of 5 and 0. Oh. Now it's a complicated. Now it's a complicated. Now, six months later, Google's brainchild defeated multiple world champion Lee Sedol. And two years later, another version of AlphaGo, Zero, appeared. Now, its name refers to the number of batches that's used for training. 
That's right, this neural network only knew the general rules and learned by playing with itself only. Now, the duel between the new version of AlphaGo, which defeated Lee Sedol, turned out to be a triumph for Zero. It won with a score of 100 to Zero. The result kind of shocked the professional community. Prior to the launch of AlphaGo, Experts estimated the computer would learn to beat a person no earlier than 2025. But the self-learning neural network made a real breakthrough in the use of artificial intelligence. It outperformed all previous versions of AlphaGo. Specifically, it defeated the version of AlphaGo that won against the world champion Lisa Doll. Now, do you see the difference between AlphaGo and IBM's chess computer? Well, I think I can. It's clearly not a calculator on steroids anymore but it really can be called artificial intelligence in a true form. According to human rivals, Google's brainchild demonstrated an understanding of the game and even surprised opponents with non-standard moves that were never seen before. Some of them have actually already been uh, used and adopted by professional players. Artificial intelligence, which is able to find hidden patterns and identify patterns of player behavior, attracted the attention of developers of AML systems. Intelligent. Moreover, their work has increased considerably. The coronavirus pandemic has changed a lot in the world of e-commerce, and 2020 was remembered not only for the colossal growth of internet payment systems, but also for the wave of hacking of large companies that we experienced. For example, the personal data of 400 million users was stolen from Estee Lauder alone. The list goes on. But do you know why such data is actually needed by scammers? to breed mules. Money mules are people who effectively receive illegally obtained money into their accounts and then they transfer it onwards. This is a classic scheme used by money launderers around the world. If we draw an analogy with the computing world, mules play the role of proxy servers. In practice, it can be very difficult to trace this kind of chain of behavior and money effectively disappears from sight. Prior to the COVID pandemic, pre-existing accounts were often actually used as mules. Sometimes scammers gained access to them by stealing passwords. Sometimes social engineering methods came into play. People were actually persuaded to transfer the accidentally transferred amount to another account. And some customers actually made deliberate payments for a small percentage. In 2021, the situation changed dramatically. In 90% of cases, new bank customers became the mules. There are thriving trading platforms on the darknet where you can actually buy a full set of personal data of a real person, which scammers can then use to open new bank accounts, right? Now it's becoming more profitable than ever, even for say payments of just a few hundred dollars. Banks don't actually pay much attention to transfers of such amounts. And the security services mainly monitor attempts to take over old accounts and thus, well, the modern mule remains invisible. He opens an account using someone else's documents, and at first he looks like a law-abiding citizen, right? He has not yet formed a pattern of behavior. Now, when it becomes apparent this person is engaged in illicit activity, well, the mule will already finished his work and moved on. The search for such anomalies is one of the most striking abilities of the neural network AI systems. Patterns in small-scale operations of mules are fixed as clearly as the position of stones on, say, a Go board. The system will spot the new pattern even before AML specialists find out about it and describe it in the rules, right? Artificial intelligence systems are able to change the perception of AML specialists in relation to customer segmentation. They're usually divided by country and city, maybe industry and business size. And the result here is logical clusters, similar to industry catalogs. Artificial intelligence is able to divide customers into segments based on their behavior. Now, the standard payments of any company are not going to attract the attention of the system, but the behavior characteristic of already identified fraudsters will be a glaring red flag. AI algorithms may not be limited to banking information only. They can actually be trusted to collect information from open sources so that the AML analyst immediately has all of the necessary information at hand to make a decision. Do you remember the story with my card in Amsterdam? Well, if such a system was already working in the bank, the analyst would not have a single question after he saw my selfie against the background of the Rake Museum. At least the guys from IBM claim that their system reduces the number of false positive warnings by 70%. However, OSI and T tools deserve a separate conversation, which we will definitely return to in the future. Financial organizations are extremely conservative in nature. Therefore, progress in the use of artificial intelligence systems has been bypassed by banks for a long time. Despite this, it is here in the pre-existing information systems that there is something that will allow AI to develop as efficiently as possible. 
I'm talking about structured, formalized, and reliable data. All reports of suspicious payments, internal reports, and detailed FATF recommendations are an ideal set of training data for neural networks. Every month, American banks conduct more and more transactions, and records about them are ideal material for training neural networks. We should really be starting now with this stuff. And of course, such systems will require certainly a more complex infrastructure. The costs of building data centers will increase. The number of programmers and, say, machine learning specialists will also increase. Remember I said that more than 50% of banks are actually trying to implement artificial intelligence systems right now? Well, the UBS Evidence Lab report provides more detailed information on this. Now, at least 75% of banks with assets of more than $100 billion and just 46% of banks with smaller assets use or are still implementing AI-based tools. Artificial intelligence is not a cheap pleasure. Can you guess which banks will now be paying more attention to financial fraudsters? And of course, no matter how well a computer plays chess or Go, the final decision should always be made by human AML specialists. Or are you ready to trust artificial intelligence? Anyway, my name is Bradley, and I hope you've enjoyed the video, and I will see you next time. Thanks for joining us. If a system like AlphaGo can learn all the moves in Go well enough to beat a person, then it has the potential to replace lawyers and accountants, among dozens of other jobs.